Welcome everybody to this new episode of the My Data Guest series. Today's guest is a long time NIME expert, a tech supporter, an extension developer, and I don't know, and whatnot. So I would like to welcome Steve Raffley. Hi. Hi. Steve is the principal scientist of for medicinal chemistry and cheminformatics at Vernalis from Cambridge, UK. He's also a trumpet player in his spare time. Uh, he's here because he received the COTM award in January 2023. He received the award mainly because he's the man behind the Vernalis extension. Uh, so the Vernalis extension is one of the most valuable, popular and best supported extensions by the NIME community. So thanks for being with us today. Thanks for the invitation, Rosaria. So let's start with a few questions. Um, I usually start with, you know, uh, allowing the guest to talk about himself, since I can only say that much. So let's briefly introduce yourself, your professional self. Uh, and what does a data scientist for medicinal chemistry and cheminformatics do? And if you can, if you can explain to us what medicinal chemistry and cheminformatics are. Okay, I'll, I'll give that a try. So I... I started my life, uh, my adult life in terms of professional life, doing a, PhD, doing a degree in chemistry and then going on to do a PhD in chemistry. And I did a little bit of computer based work during that time, but not very much. And then I got a job with a small university startup company near Cambridge called Riber Targets. Um, and I started there as a medicinal chemist. So medicinal chemistry is. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry, we're looking to design new drugs to make people who are ill better. Um, medicinal chemistry is, is the, the part of that process where people decide what new molecules to make and then actually make them. Um, downstream from there, people do all sorts of different tests on them. So biological screening, mm -hmm. uh, biophysical screening um, and so on. And um, <clears throat> uh, those results come back to the medicinal chemist who has to decide where to go next. So that's what medicinal chemistry is. Cheminformatics is, well, our sort of currency in medicinal chemistry is chemicals, mo molecules. And so uh, cheminformatics is about computer representations of those molecules. So how do we get the, the chemical structures that as chemists we scribble on whiteboards and on the front of human cupboards and everywhere else. How do we get those into a computer in a way that a computer can use um, both just to store them and to display them, but also to calculate lots of different properties and to do things with them. So, um, for example, um, when we do a reaction in the lab, we take some chemicals and we make them into something else. And um, one of the things cheminformatics does is that mirror that process computationally. So you take a list of different starting materials and you generate a list of reagents, which is much more reliable than the, the chemist trying to draw each one manually and much less time consuming. So that's that's what cheminformatics is. Um, and so I guess a data scientist in medicinal chemistry and cheminformatics is using the data, any data from uh, from, from medicinal chemistry, so that can be uh, laboratory data from the chemistry group itself. Uh, it can also be other data that's associated with the compounds that we've made that come out downstream. And it's quite a varied data. Some of it is very simple data, like a number. Um, and some of it is really quite complicated data, um, 3D structures with huge proteins also thrown into the mix. So that's that's about what we do. Oh, okay. Um, let's say simple was not, but yeah, it's clear. <laughs> so, but you you are a principal scientist. So, what does your role entail, and and what what services does Vernalis offer? So, my role as principal scientist is that I've not for quite a while been associated with a particular project. Um, I provide information and support for quite a few different projects. Um, across Vernalis um, and what Vernalis offers is um, 
primarily looking for early stage district discovery projects. So supporting projects when a company is trying to get them off the ground, um, particularly if they're difficult targets. Um, so for example, protein protein interactions were rather than a little small molecule interacting with a big protein, you have two big proteins that are uh, interacting with each other in some way uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a person. And um, we're trying to, in some way, interrupt that interaction. Um, and we, we tend to focus on, on difficult targets because that becomes more interesting. And that's sort of developed over time. Um, and as a, along the way, we've developed quite a few new technologies, some of which are, of course, our Vinalis community contribution. So if, if, you're, if you're a pharmaceutical company and you've got a tricky early stage target or you want to get a new target going, then come and talk to us. Okay, it has to be difficult. Uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's your goal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there aren't easy targets, but even, 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 the, even the easy targets are difficult. But we seem to have found I ourselves with really difficult targets. Great. Um, so in the introduction, I said that you are an IME user a tech supporter, an extension developer, a trumpet player. Um, so what do you think is your main role among all those? And so what, what would you like to be remembered for? Um, so I guess my main role is a NIME user. So we have a NIME server at Analis, and I spend quite a lot of time um, writing workflows to solve people's problems in the company. Um, or even just to, to do some actual investigation myself of data and what data we have and what we can do with it. Um, and that's actually where I started becoming an extension developer. Uh, I started writing nodes once I worked out how to do it um, to help with that process as I found things that I couldn't do with existing nodes. Um, and then of course, once you've started developing extensions, then you have to support it and you have to help people um, and people have problems and people find bugs and, and so on. So then all of those things. But what would I most like to remember for? Probably the trumpet player. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, let's continue with the Vernalis extension. We go back to the trumpet player later. Um, so the Vernalis extension for Nime Analytics platform. So uh, what is the Vernalis extension? What tasks does it implement? How can people access it? So Vernalis is, a, is now quite a big extension. Um, it's got a lot of nodes in it. It also has a, really? um, a, a user interface feature, which adds a little extra menu bar to the top of the workflow editor, which allows you to do stuff with selecting different nodes. But, it started out as an extension based in chemoinformatics. Um, and then it slowly extended into other um, areas uh, over time, partly because I'd written internal nodes that um, were not chemoinformatics nodes, but were things that I found. Like, for example, um, it came up, I think, recently on LinkedIn, the, the three port loop end and the four port loop end. And, um, because I needed those nodes myself and and then other people obviously also needed them and so um, they also joined the, the community contribution um, so that's that's kind of what it does it does lots of different things um, it does stuff we have a set of nodes on um, manipulating collection uh, columns we have nodes for we have various loops we have flow control stuff um, if switches and, and so on. Um, I can confirm it. It's, uh, it's huge. Uh, many, many nodes. And frankly, I'm not a cheminformatician, but I, I use it. I use the loop nodes a lot and other non-cheminformatic related nodes. Uh, definitely uh, not only for cheminformaticians. Yeah. Um, in terms of how you can get it, then you can install it from the hub, although I've never installed an extension by that route. So I, I'm not going to say any more than that on how to do it that way. But also you can go to the help menu in Nime and on there there's an extension, there's an option to install new yeah. and you can do it that route on the trusted community contributions uh, update site, which you have to select. 
it should be there. Perfect. Um, so when there, there are many, many nodes in this extension. Um, so when did you start working on those? What, what was your the first node you developed? So the, the, you first, wrote the first line of code. Yeah, it wasn't me. So the, the first node was our, our PDB connector node, which in its original form has now um, been deprecated. It doesn't work. So you have old workflows put it in, then you will need to update. Um, that node to the to the newer version, which came out in 2020. That node was written by a guy called Dave Morley, um, who used to work with with me uh, when we were Riber targets back in the early 2000s. Um, and he uh, was actually he'd left by then, but we we, we contracted him uh, to to write that node, um, which he did. And that must have been about 2011. And we had a plan, which was to, to release it to the community after we'd used it a bit ourselves and made sure it, it worked and it was robust and, and so on, um, which we did. Uh, we did that in 2012, both through Dave's website at Inspiral Discovery, where he worked at the time, and also through our own uh, Vanalis website. Um, and we have no idea how many people ever saw that one node extension because we had no way of measuring that data. Um, and then it sat there for a while. And then in June 2013, we relaunched in the, in the NIMP community. Um, and that, that coincided with a user group day in London, which I spoke at. So that was my first NIMP talk. Um, so, so Dave wrote that first node. Um, I then wrote a few other nodes. And to be honest, I'm not sure which nodes I wrote first, but things like the PDB saver and the PDB downloader nodes that are in the, which are again, chemioinformatics nodes, um, were probably some of the first ones I wrote because they were things I was doing repeatedly. And it, um, at the time I didn't really know much Java. I didn't know much Python and it became very tedious on my part to have to hunt through my workspace to find where the snippet was that I figured out how to make that work previously. So that's why I eventually wrote the node, those nodes. And that, that's where it started for me at least. It has been a long journey then. Uh, I mean, now it's uh, more than 10 years. So Yeah, so I first, I first encountered NIME itself in late 2010, probably about this sort of time, 2010, autumn 2010. Yeah. So, um, do you know how many nodes does it contain now? What's the last count? Well, I had to work this out yesterday. Um, I, I actually wrote a nine workflow to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a meta workflow, the workflow to count the workflows. Yeah. So it, currently there are 242 nodes in the in, in How many? 242. Oh, OK. Which, 242 nodes. Yeah. Which, which surprised me quite a lot when I read that. And there are another 46 nodes that were in there that have been deprecated. So yeah. It's 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 a big extension and it's the most downloaded extension that, that the NIME community has. So yeah, congratulations then again. <laughs> so um among all those nodes, what's your preferred node? I think of of the nodes, I mean there's there's a there's a lot of nodes that I really like, but possibly the multiple loop end, which yeah. at the time was the only, I wrote it when, when it became possible to write configurable nodes where you can change the, the port yeah. types and the number of ports, because the idea we had a three port loop end and a four port loop end. And I think we had another one with optional input ports that was up to six ports. And then I think one day I suddenly needed seven ports and I thought, no, this is silly. Don't write another node to do seven ports. And so I wrote the multi port loop end. It was also my first configurable node. So I had to work out about how that all worked. Um, and then one of the other features that perhaps people haven't noticed, even if they use the node, is that um, the, the node has got a view. And so during the loop execution, you can actually get a preview of, I think it's the last 50 rows of the tables. So you can see what's happening in the loop, what what that table looks like as it's going. So you don't have to wait until your loop's in its hundred thousand 
iterations or whatever to see what's what's in there which i know i i saw people at other people in the i'm forum at various points asking that same question so um so that feature is in there so that's probably my single single favorite node from the whole lot everybody has his favorite node but th yeah this one is very cool definitely <laughs> So let's, uh, I'm going to address now the NIME user. So let's stop with the Vernalis extension. Let's address the NIME user. So why did you choose to develop an extension for NIME? Why did you choose NIME? So, so I first started using NIME about this sort of time in the year, back in 2010. And the, the reason for that was I, was I was writing a paper at the time, which became more, um, more successful than I ever anticipated. Um, about the sorts of chemistry that medicinal chemists were doing, um, not least because there was a sort of stereotype that we only did two or three different sorts of reactions and um, that's all we ever did. Um, medicinal chemists did boring chemistry. Um, and one day I sat down with a colleague and we said, oh, I wonder if it's true. And we started to look at the data and there was a lot of manual classification that we did. Um, and what we ended up with was, well, he, he, he actually moved to a different company by the time we finished the analysis or the, the, the data gathering of the analysis. So, so he was in Manchester and I was in still in Cambridge and um, we both had copies of Excel spreadsheets, um, which needed combining with huge long lists for each paper we'd considered. And there were about a thousand papers in our data set. Um, and so, um, my colleague James Davidson said, "Oh, you, you might want to try this this thing I've been playing with a bit called Nine. Yeah. And uh, I had tried another pipeline uh, workflow tool, and I got nowhere at all with it. I'm not going to name it, um, but um, I thought, okay, I'll give it a try. And I very rapidly was able to do what I wanted to do, which was to add up lots of different totals and stuff. And it was a very simple use case, but it." It would have been a complete pain to do um, outside of nine, and so that's where it started. And then I can't remember what I did with it after that first example, but I found myself using it lots. Um, it's addictive. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's that's where it started. So it was recommendation from a colleague who was, I say, he was investigating at the time whether we could use it at Vanalis and what sorts of benefits we could get from it. So the answer is clearly, yes, we, we did decide we could use it at Vanalis. Yeah. So, but um, you said that it made your work faster, at least this first approach. Um, so how, how, how else did NIME help with your work? So faster, so, we heard that, accurate, yeah. agile. So, so, so one thing I've, I found I was involved in a technology project of Analis about nearly 10 years ago now, which we, we, we published. And that project involved um, working with libraries of making libraries of compounds. Um, and our plan was to try and short speed up the process of going from when you make the compound to when you, when you get the test biological screening results. By, chop, by chopping out all the purification steps that we normally do in the middle. And this is a sort of step that um, chemists can get quite, quite sort of fussy about. They really want to make sure that they've really got the right compound and it's really clean. Um, and so it can take quite a lot of time, particularly you can, it's very easy to put lots of reactions on in parallel. You just get you know, big rows of tubes, fill them all up and set it going. And then you have to deal with the consequences. And you can't do that in parallel so easily particularly not in a small company and so um we had this sort of idea of how to do it and we had a few sort of small test sets we had done with only sort of five or six compounds um and then we decided to see if we could kind of industrialize it and so um a lot of biological screening is done in um little plates about about so big um with uh an eight by twelve array of tubes so 96 well tubes and I tried to do the chemistry in that uh, the chemistry worked but the problem is we did want to do an analytical step to check that we had some product in there and get some sense did we have a hundred percent conversion 
Did we have 50% conversion? Did we only have one conversion? Or was there no sign of product at all before we, we before we ran our screening steps? And I've been doing that manually. And it's fair to say that was a tedious process. You ended up with a stack of 96 A4 printouts uh, and going through them manually, trying to work out what product you should have in there, what what molecular weight, so how heavy the molecule was, which would then show up in the trace. And so going through that manually was error prone and as well as being tediously slow. And so in NIME, I, it took a while, but I iteratively improved it. So I started by just doing the chemifmatics task of generating the list of products from the list of reactants from our database. Um, and so at least I now knew the weights accurately that I was looking for. And then, then I thought, well, if I can get to that far, then the, the instrument produces a text file, which has buried deep in it. Each file is hundreds of lines long for each sample, uh, but it has buried in that data, in the, the data um, for, the, for the peaks and for the compounds. And then, so I, I wrote an iron workflow and the first time I did the work, it was, it had a couple of huge nested loops with about 60 nodes in each loop. Um, That's it, right. It, it, yeah, and it took hours to run, but it was still faster. Um, and then I reduced it to a couple of Java snippets, um, and that was considerably faster. Uh, and then eventually I actually converted it into a few nodes to do it. And it, um, we actually I had it set up so that it, eventually it would run on our NIME server, and it would. All I did was when I started the chemistry, I set the workflow running on the server and it would poll the instrument every five minutes for about two weeks uh, until it got to the point where it found a sample for everything in my library. And once it found all the samples, it then did the analysis. And the first few times I did it, I the, the cases where it didn't find any product, I would go and manually check. and. I think there's always a temptation as a chemist, you really want to find product in there somewhere. So you're really sort of scraping around in the noise in the data and trying to convince yourself it might be there. Um, what I eventually found was that if Naim didn't find it, it wasn't her. And so the process went to taking about 10 minutes to run in Naim. And um, it was also far more accurate than I ever was. Because if you start trying to type in 100 entries into a table, you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, so, manual doesn't scale. Sorry? Manual yeah. doesn't scale, I mean. Yes, yeah, yeah. so it's accuracy, it's speed, and, and, re and just reliability. And it doesn't have the optimism either that you might have when you've already invested several days of work into something. <laughs> I see, yeah. Okay, so a question that I ask all NIME users that uh, are here guests uh, at this podcast. So will you name for us the NIME feature or the NIME node that you could not do without? I was thinking about this quite, quite a lot, and I think it's perhaps not one node, but there's a set of nodes that do similar things, which is group by and pivot and the column aggregator nodes, which kind of reshape tables and then they're, they're, they're sort of opposite to each other the ungroup the select split collection column and the unpivot nodes and they they are such powerful nodes because they completely can reshape data from well from from a format that you've you've acquired it from somewhere into a format that's perhaps more usable i have to say that the unpivot node is the possibly the hardest node I've ever found to configure. And I have to read the instructions, the node description every single time I use it, even even yeah. still 10 years later. But uh, but th that set of nodes, and see that they're all nine, but none of those are vanilla nodes. <laughs> no, not the, the, so aggregation and disaggregation. So what, yeah. what about AI? Did you use the new nine nodes for AI? Are yeah. you going to use them? No? I haven't used them. Um, will I use them? I don't know. Okay. Maybe I'll have a look one day. <laughs> Maybe, eventually. Okay. So let's uh, address now the forum supporter. You have all these personalities, you know, I have to address them one by one. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's address now the forum supporter. So you're very active on the Nine forum. Um, so what's your username on the Nine forum so that everybody recognizes you if they go on to the Nine forum? 
So I, I actually have two usernames. I have one which is in, in my name, which is S roughly, no no punctuation. And then I also have another one which is more obviously tied to my job, which is Vanalis as a username. Um, and I, I tried not to have conversations between the two users on the forum. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I, I try and use the Vanalis username, particularly for announcements about the Vanalis extension and for answering feedback and questions about it. I tend to use my own username for other more general stuff. Yeah. So which which one? Which questions do you answer more often? Uh, the chem informatic question or the general questions? Um, I used to answer lots of general questions, but I've but there are, there's now quite a lot of other users who are perhaps even better, far better at answering them than me. Um, people like Armin, um, and so I tend to stick to the chemifmatics questions, um, and in particular, oh, I have to, obviously I have to answer questions about Vanalis extension because we're interested extension, but I, I, t I tend to answer those questions more because they're also the questions that I'm probably more familiar with what the answers might be. Um, yeah. You're probably the, the best expert to answer the yeah. questions about the Vernalis nodes, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's my forum users. I do also have, a, it's, this is not an official account, it's a, it's a, a Twitter account called Dr. Nime Node, which came about because years ago somebody found my email address and obviously been scraping around the internet and came up with the name Nime Node. And <laughs> so I got, I got emails to Dear Dr. Nime Node for quite a long time. And so colleagues suggested I should get a sign printed on my desk and, and have Dr. Nime Node's consultancy <laughs> sessions. Um, we can call you Dr. Nime Node now. Here. So yeah, so I, 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 I thought that would do as a Twitter handle. I'd say it's purely just to separate my, my other interests on Twitter from <laughs> stuff about nine. <laughs> I see, I see. So what's the most difficult question you ever had to answer on the forum? Well, it's a question I've been asked about three times, and it's my own fault, actually. There is one of our nodes is called the match molecular pairs fragment, uh, fragment to pairs node. And it has an option in the node, which is called, which is allow self transforms. And I've been asked the question on the forum, uh, in person and by email by different people, which is, could I give um, a real world example of what that option does? And every time I found that I still can't give an answer to that question. And I give a bit of background, which is that when I was writing the node and testing it, I realized there was a situation where um, I should explain what a match molecular power is to make any sense of this. Um, so a maximum active pair is when you have two chemical structures that are very, very similar, but they have a very small change, then they're a maximum molecular pair. And so what, what this node is doing, the, the first step is it breaks the structures apart and then it tries to join them up to see which to find pairs. And it's possible that you can break a molecule in multiple places and actually find a pair by the two molecules that you're actually joined back together being the same molecule which i think with hindsight is a bit of an esoteric sort of corner case with no real world use but i allowed it as not i had it an option to allow this to be done um and people have asked since is there a real world use for it and the answer is i don't know so if anybody knows the answer and has found a real world use for that option then please do let me know <laughs> i see okay <laughs> Okay, so let me address now the community developer. Um, so this is a bit of a special interview with respect to the other interviews because we talk about developing an extension and more than actually using NIME. So on this line, um, let, can you tell us a few words of advice for the people out there, uh, the developers out there who would like to write an extension for NIME? Um, how is the Vernalis extension written, for example? Is that Java or Python? So the Vernalis extension is written entirely in, in Java. Um, I have very limited Python experience. Um, 
my Python and Java started off at the same time at the same level, which was zero back in 2010. Um, my Python possibly kind of crept a little bit ahead for a while, but then it stopped and I've barely used it since. So I, I actually find it even difficult to type for Python because I find myself putting semicolons in and curly braces that are all Java things. That, um, so it's entirely, um, entirely written in Java. Um, I haven't yet tried the new way of writing notes in Python. Um, because I haven't really, come up, I haven't come up with a reason to do so yet. So, <laughs> so how easy is it to write an extension for Nime? I think if you're, as a developer, if you're familiar with Java, then it, that definitely helps, which I wasn't when I first tried. Um, there were a lot of concepts that I only kind of learned by doing it and suddenly having light bulb, mo light bulb moments later of realizing, oh, that's that's why that works. Um, if you're familiar with the Eclipse, the whole Eclipse sort of platform where you have things grouped into plugins and then plugins that group into features, then again, that makes life easier because that's the, the nuts and bolts of, of writing and I'm uh, extension. Um, once, once you're familiar with that, it's it's not actually very difficult at all um and then there's a there's a few sort of things set about setting it like making sure that you can build it and particularly if you want to build it automatically and deploy it to users internally or um then obviously you have to set that up if you're doing it in the nine community then um gabriel and stefan are both really helpful always on the end of an email to answer questions and they set up a lot of that um, for us. In fact, actually, Torsten, back when we first started, was the person doing that, so, um, which was good because I think at that point we hadn't got a clue what we were doing in that part of the process. So now you have been maintaining this extension now for more than 10 years. So what's the most complicated part of maintaining an extension? Um, the, I think the, the, the most complicated thing has been as, as the Nine platform has, has evolved and as Java has evolved, we started out, our first extension was published when we were Java 6 and we're now on Java, well, Nine is currently Java 17, Java 21 was released a couple of weeks ago. Um, there have been things that have needed just to change to make things keep working. Java's changed, Eclipse has changed and so it's just keeping on keeping on top of those things, some of which have been not very obvious at the time as to what was needed. Um, obviously, by the time we as community developers um, are getting to that point, somebody in Nime has already had to do that. So um, we've found ourselves picking brains at Nime a few times as to why, why doesn't this work anymore? <laughs> what, what do we need to do? And, yeah. Things change, yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about the success of the Vernalis extension. Why do you think is that? Why do you think is the Vernalis extension so successful? Um, I guess, I mean, I think early on, we, uh, people obviously wanted the functionality, I think particularly the PDB connector node, um, people wanted that functionality in time. Um, <clears throat> Um, judging by the number of people that have asked questions about it, we know that there are quite a few users out there of that node. Um, but I think um, you know, the chemoinformatics community is, is a finite, limited community. And I think perhaps our success has been that we also have, um, you know, we, we have nodes that are more generally use, usable. As you said yourself, Rosario, you use some of our nodes um and that means we've kind of got a bigger audience than a dedicated chemifmatics or dedicated but uh, any other sort of dedicated um sort of niche area contribution um so i get i get i would guess that's why but 
probably have to ask some of the users who I, I don't know who they are. <laughs> I, I think it's also I think it's also because of the maintenance. I mean, it, it's uh, to develop something is easy. To maintain it over the years, of course, is the biggest challenge. And you have done a great job at that. I mean, all those years. So I think definitely uh, that's part of the success. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I don't think <laughs> I, I don't think I realized what I was letting myself in for when I started. <laughs> <laughs> you need a bit of uh, you know courage. Um, okay. So now that uh, uh, you have all this experience and you know what it takes to develop some uh, some extension, do you have any word of advice for our you know the, the aspiring extension developers uh, in our audience? Um, you know, do, is there a special need, uh, a niche that needs to be filled by some uh, other extension? Do they, what do they need to know um, to start developing an extension? Should they get a course? Should they start from the documentation? Um, I, th I would say, um, uh, I, I put some advice in, in the, um, in, in this book, the, the best of nine, um, recently which was you know which is around and it, it sounds very obvious but, but try and make sure that before you develop an extension just make sure that nobody else has actually already done the same thing there's, there's been a few times and, and and i think one of the great things about nine is there are lots of different ways you can tackle most problems and there's been a few times where um i've written a note because i could think of no not, no possible way of doing something and somebody said oh i'd always do that using this node so, oh. so, so yeah, try try and make sure it sounds obvious, but try and make sure that nobody else has already done it. Um, uh, gaps, I don't know. I guess, I guess if you're using Nime, use, if you use Nime and you find gaps, then those are your gaps. So, um, find your own. Yeah, <laughs> find your find find your own. I mean, that's that's basically what I've done. Is as I've needed stuff. I've in it um in terms of learning how to do it i think there is documentation um which is definitely worth a look um when i was quite a quite a new nine developer the the were on-site courses in zurich in mm. at zurich uh, at nine in zurich I, I don't know whether those sorts of courses either on site or online but interactive still exist but they, they were really good and um, certainly for me the, other, the other advantage of that was that I, I got to know a few people from Nime and I also I actually got to find my way around Eclipse itself a bit better which even just some really silly simple keyboard shortcuts that make life a lot easier um, so it, definitely have a look at the documentation um, if there are courses yeah go on, go on a course um, just because it's it's worth starting out doing things in kind of best practice way, which is what's um, what's explained in those resources. Um, because otherwise, you only end up having to go back and fix stuff later. Okay, um, so now. I have left to address the trumpet player, but before we continue with the trumpet player questions, I would like to call in this time. Today is Luca. Roberto is not here today. So I would like to call in Luca uh, to see if there are questions from the audience. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, firstly, uh, a big thanks. Thank you to Steve for joining us in our special guest on this uh, edition of My Data Guest. And uh, it was uh, awesome hearing your story and learning from your experience, especially uh, about the notes uh, you developed and how he's been a uh, great support. And really, I have a question. And my first question is about Nime. And being a frequent user of Nime, I would like to hear your opinion uh, about the new version. Uh, what, what do you think? Uh, are the aspects uh, that you particular appreciate uh, or that you think will be improved? I haven't, <laughs> I haven't used the new version very, to, uh, very much, to be honest. Um, I think because it, because I've got very used to the, the, the old version. And so I've, I've not really explored the new version in great detail. Um, 
I, I've had a few conversations in Berlin about it and uh, uh, um, and a few emails, but I, 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 I'm not a great fan at the moment. But, okay, <laughs> but okay, it's, yeah, it's yeah. familiar and it's different, so I guess. We I can guess postpone the question to later. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, maybe it's always uh, the same. When you work for uh, a lot of years with the same version and you change, uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah so, so I, I still think of what's now the classic view as, as the new yeah, version. Because yeah. when I first used it, it had the beveled three dimensional nodes that had sort of shiny effects and stuff. So. Yeah, you have yeah. been through many different new versions <laughs> <laughs> about the UI. Yeah, it's true. Okay, okay. <laughs> and thank you for uh, for, uh, and uh, for me, it, it's all. Thank you, and uh, see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Luca. Uh, then le let's continue with the last uh, questions for the trumpet player. So, what is uh, um, tell us more about your activity as a trumpet player? So, what do you do exactly? Do you give so, concerts? So yeah, so I um, as of January this year, I've been playing back in a brass band, which I think started out as a very British musical setup and tradition. Although I know that there is a there is a now a, a British style brass band in Berlin um, in the British Open Championships, which is a big competition we have. Brass bands love competitions. Um, there was a, a Swiss band came second in the British Open Championship this year. So um, I play a uh, cornet in that, which is very very similar to a trumpet. Um, technical differences, which probably will get people leaving this quite quickly when you start going into them. Um, so I, I, I play in a brass band. Um, I've been playing, I used to do that a lot when I was younger, and then I had quite a long gap. I got back into it this year. I have played in, I think, six concerts so far this year with them. I have another one on Sunday coming up in Cambridge, um, which will be fun. Um, and it's it's really it's a for me it's a it's a kind of an escape and I for three hours every week in a rehearsal I have to think really hard about the music in front of me and what I'm doing and so I can forget about anything else that I'm worried about for three hours. I see and, the point. Yeah, and it and it's a social thing, you know. You you, you meet other people, um, whereas otherwise you see small group of people every day that you work with or that you live with. So I see a different group of people and yeah. So what's your preferred music piece? Um I I'm quite a fan of so one of the one of the music formats is um Russ Bands play is, is things called his marches and although we generally don't march around playing them but um so for the concert this weekend we're playing a uh, a march called Kenilworth by a um, composer, brass band, 20th century brass band composer called Arthur Bliss. Um, and it's for, for when we first played it back in uh, September when we came back from our summer break. I missed it, but I thought there's no way I can play this part all the way through. This isn't going to work, and it, it is going to work. It'll be, it's going to work. So, at the moment, I think that's my favorite piece because I know how hard I found it when I first picked it up. <laughs> I see. So, and uh, the last question then, it's always about AI. Now everybody talks about AI. So do you envision using AI to create a new music piece for the trumpet? Personally, no, but there's a, um, a friend sent me something a while back. So, um, and I'm not quite sure what the practical purpose of this this is, but um, somebody had taken the idea of taking uh, sort of encoders that people use to put something into an AI. Uh, in this case, um, sort of represent molecules, so back to the chemioformatics, into AI and um, into an internal sort of vectory type format. Um, and obviously, the AI does its stuff, and then you have a decoder at the other end to, to get the answer out, whatever the answer is. And what they had done is taken uh, a molecule encoder and then they'd run 
the encoded format back out into a music encoder. And so they'd come up with, with bits of music that, that represent, that were or a musical representation of a molecule. So I'd say, I, I don't know what the practical implica application of that is, but um, <laughs> it certainly shows where, you can generate the your, <laughs> Yeah, that's where all your personalities then go back together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think I could imagine that people, well, I, I could imagine people would use it for that purpose, for the purpose of writing music. I could also imagine perhaps using it to, to arrange music, so say something that's been written for orchestra, for rearrange it for, for a brass group, or um, the other thing, of course, is brass players get obsessive about mouthpiece design um, and how deep the cup is, and how wide the cup is, and how wide the bore is, and what shape the cup is, and how heavy the mouthpiece is, and all these different things that all have slight effects on the tone and and so on. And I can imagine that there might be if there isn't already people out there using AI to try and design, improve or refine mouthpiece design. Um, but again, that's not, oh, sure. not, not me at the moment. <laughs> okay. So, and with this, we conclude this month's episode of My Data Guest. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you for the great conversation. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on NIME, on the extension development, on the chem informatics, on the trumpet playing, on the support on the forum. So we have covered all sorts of topics. Uh, so thank you also to the audience for staying with us until the end and see you in the next episode. Thank you.